So um, I thought what I would do is kick off with a very short reading from a prairie story. Since how many times are you going to find a Toronto boy writing a prairie story? But I, wrote, I worked uh, when I was uh, 20 years old in the 1970s in Gull Lake, Saskatchewan as a train operator. And it was a summer job in between my studies at the University of British Columbia. And uh, I had a really haunting experience that summer uh, working for uh, CP Rail in a one-person train shop where no train stopped. And I was basically involved with train traffic control, so I was a train operator. And uh, it was a, an amazing job. Uh, I'd spend the whole nights alone in this train station, but maybe three or four times a night, a, you know, a mile-long train would come barreling through Gull Lake, and I'd have to hoop up messages to the conductor uh, in the back of the train and, uh, and the engineer and the front of the train. So I wrote a short story, you know, sort of fictionalizing and dramatizing that experience of working on the trains in Gull Lake, Saskatchewan uh, in 1977. And so what I thought I'd do is uh, read a short snippet from that story. Since it's uh, likely to appear in an anthology that the University of Alberta Press is planning to publish in a year or two with ten other, or nine other writers who've also been brown bag writers. So I'll read a little bit from that uh, short story, and then I'll switch over and talk to you about the illegal and give you a short reading from that. So this uh, short story, uh, which first appeared a few years ago in the Walrus magazine, in which I abbreviated slightly for the purposes of this uh, U of A anthology, is called Meet You at the Door. This happened back in dinosaur days, in the town of Gull Lake, Saskatchewan, population 800. The gulls had all died, and the lake had dried up. <laughs> On the Saskatchewan farmlands, oil pumps bobbed up and down, looking like black grasshoppers on steroids. Folks were fuming about the metric system and had a nickname for the new top-loading railway car, a Trudeau Hopper. I had other preoccupations. A ghost had chased me out of the university and had hounded me for a year in Greece, Italy, France, and Spain. And now I was back in Canada to take a summer job in a place where I knew no one. I had hitchhiked into town to work in the one-room station of the Canadian Pacific Railway. On my left arm, balanced against my chest, was an L.C. Smith typewriter, heavy enough to be a weapon of war. Catapulted over a battlefield, it could have taken a man out. In my right hand was a classical guitar purchased from in Granada from the man who made it. On my back was a knapsack stitched with the Canadian flag so Europeans wouldn't take me for an American. It was 1977. The summer job was part of my recovery plan. I walked past the Mad Dog Bar and into town, ringing doorbells and asking for a room to rent. On my sixth attempt, a woman answered. She looked like she'd been born around the time of my great-grandmother. Everything about her was white. Hair, socks, nursing shoes. On her clothesline out back, flapping in the wind, hung white underwear the size of a parachute. <laughs> she stood no taller than five feet. Blue eyes, clear as lake water. She stepped back when she saw me, but listened when I spoke. She said she wouldn't mind my working nights, she said her old son, Jimmy, could keep a job for about as long as she could hold a spooked horse. <laughs> she said I was welcome to stay for $25 a month. Her name was Eleanor Hadfield. She'd been widowed a long time ago. As she spoke, Eleanor Hadfield kept checking out my hair. Have you ever seen a mammoth pine tree in southern Spain? No branches all the way up, but at the top there's an eruption of foliage. I had an afro like that. <laughs> also, I was dark, like the best part of a chocolate eclair. Some of my looks came from my father and his people, and some came from spending much of the past year in southern Europe. I'd stayed in shared rooms, youth hostel style, sleeping inches from strangers, one looking clubbed and comatose, and the next gnawing like a purring brontosaurus. I changed cities every night on the run from that voice in my head. Come on, it said. It's not so bad. Can you provide me with one good reason to go on living? Come over this way, it said. I'll meet you at the door. For a year, the voice had been tracking me like a bounty hunter. From my bedroom one Sunday morning, I heard Mrs. Hadfield's son railing about me. In the small house, I heard every word. 
Why had she not consulted him before renting to me? What if I ransacked her house? Have you considered this? Her son kept saying. Have you even looked at him? <laughs> Jimmy, she said. He's a gentleman. He may not look like one, but he is. <laughs> Mother, he said. Nothing good can come of this. Jimmy, she said. Eat your pie. <laughs> Soon enough, Eleanor Hatfield began to ask me to join her in the kitchen for pies, cakes, cookies, and roast beef. Most of all, she liked serving me potatoes, fried, baked, cookie-thin and roasted, or boiled, under gravy, over rice, in casseroles, all alone. One day, while I was writing, she brought me a mug of tea and said, I've got more ways for potato than all the keys on your typewriter. <laughs> I bet you do. She ran her finger along the platen of my L.C. Smith and declared that it was as smooth and hard as a rolling pin. What are you so busy writing? Just trying to get my thoughts out. I hear you typing half the day, she said, fingers coming along like rain. Does the sound bother you? No, she said. It's the sound of you being here. Passenger trains didn't stop in Gull Lake, but freight trains had to pull off onto the side tracks to let other trains overtake or pass them on the single track across the prairie. The dispatcher in Calgary and the conductors moving all across Saskatchewan and Alberta could not communicate directly. They had to go through me, the operator. I took orders from the dispatcher and passed them along to trains highballing east and west through town. I worked alone at the station starting at 7 p.m. and worked until 6 a.m. It was up to me to know more than any person in the world about the trains that thundered each night through Gull Lake, Saskatchewan. I had to radio for permission to leave the chair and go to the bathroom. I radioed once back in the chair. The dispatcher in Calgary knew how often I pissed in an 11-hour shift <laughs> and how long it took me. It was a firing offense to fall asleep on the job. My job was to type up the dispatcher's orders and pass them on to oncoming trains. I had to be able to type them up at 50 words a minute. Typos were not allowed. It was in the rule book. If you made a typo, you had to say so. Then you had to rip up your order and ask the dispatcher to give it to you all over again while you typed, while the train was bearing down at you at 50 miles an hour. I had two radios to manage. On my left, the one for incoming and outbound trains. It only worked when a train was within a five mile radius. This radio connected me to the conductor in the caboose. It was a conductor who did all the talking, to me and through me, to the dispatcher. In the radio to my right, I could hear the dispatcher any time, but he could only hear me when I pushed a foot pedal under my desk. One Tuesday in June, weeks after I settled onto the job, a conductor got my ear at 2.49 a.m. He was on a westbound train, number 901. I knew it. It was a freight train, usually about 100 cars more than a mile long. Traveling at full speed, a beast like that took 10 minutes to stop. Gullick, you there? It was the voice of an old man. Some conductors liked to kid around on the radio. Others were all business. This one sounded like he liked to hunt bears, drink beer, and watch strippers. <laughs> I pulled the, 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 the mic closer. Gullick here. Are they robbing the cradle, he said. What are you, 16? You kept your mouth shut with the dispatcher, but conductors were fair game. So I said, and are they stealing from graves these days? <laughs> no live bodies left? His guffaw sounded like a machine gun. Looky, looky, we have one with attitude. Heaven help us, what are you, a student? Sort of. Sort of, we got a politician in Gallic. We got a right regular Pierre Trudeau. <laughs> he pronounced the prime minister's name Pierre. He chuckled into the radio. I pictured him being 60 years old, which, it, which was three times my age and seemed ancient, about 57, 190 with a pot belly and stick thin legs. So, he added, got anything for me? He was testing me, trying to see if I would do him a favor and break the rules. He knew that operators were not allowed to reveal the dispatcher's orders over the radio. Shouldn't know soon, I said, where are you? 5.1 miles out, he said. Stand by, I said. I didn't know who was dispatching that night. The dispatcher would have started the shift minutes earlier. He'd be feeling his way into the night and calling me any moment. Each night presented a puzzle, needing a unique solution. 
Each night, the dispatcher in Calgary had to drop a, draw up a map of the prairies and send dozens of trains through it. Quickly, safely, fast trains had priority over slow ones. Passenger trains had priority over some freight trains, but not others. It was complicated, and that was when no animals wandered out of the tracks. A train could throw a deer or a bear as easily as a boy could pitch a baseball. But a sow was heavy and thick and had a low center of gravity. She was a mammal most likely to derail a train. Gull Lake, the dispatcher said. You there? I kept my answer short and simple. Gull Lake. He let a long, slow laugh percolate down the railway line. But I knew before the laugh who he was. Just about every dispatcher, conductor, and operator working for the Canadian Pacific Railway in the age of the dinosaur pronounced the town Gullick. So I knew, after just two words, who occupied the dispatcher's chair. His name was Weedman, but I private, privately nicknamed him Tolstoy. He pronounced the town the way it was written, pronounced it the same way I said it, Gull Lake, pausing for a nanosecond between each word. Tolstoy had been the lead instructor in my two-week operator's course in Calgary. He didn't speak much to me during the course, but took a good long look at me on the first day. Before the day ended, he said, Where are you from, man? He didn't use man with anybody else in the course. But nobody else in the course looked like me. I told him Toronto and left it at that. I'll leave that story there. But uh, the, the, it, it heats up as a train is, <laughs> as a train is, is pulling into town. You know, in the 19... 19- 80s, I started traveling to West Berlin to visit my sister, Karen, my late sister, who, um, who lived in West Berlin, as it was then called, for a decade. And uh, so I visited her three times. And I've tried to create a really interesting, dynamic, energetic person. So I'm not mocking her in any respect. I'm sort of mocking the world and how it responds to people with multiple minor statuses. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say idiotic things like, 